Hi, I'm Gerard Swan. I'm a long-term member of Quest, which is a member-led support group for LGBT plus Catholics, which has been around since about 1973. And I currently serve um, as chair to Quest and as a trustee of the charity. It's a privilege to be joining you all at the Online Gathering Voices 2021 conference today on Zoom. This is my pre-recorded contribution to the conference. I'm going to be exploring a little about what sanctuary means to me, my personal journey and the thoughts and experiences that have shaped how I understand sanctuary. I don't claim to have any definitive answers, but I'm happy to share my reflections about my journey so far with you. As a backdrop, I'm going to make a couple of assumptions that thread throughout what I want to say. My first assumption is that all of us are made in the image of God, that I believe that God is more than the exclusively heteronormative male pronoun dumped on they, them, her, him. I believe in a limitless, expansive God that I can't fully comprehend, but in whom all of us as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, questioning, intersex and asexual people can find a reflection of who we are at every stage of our sometimes complex lives and as we grow and as we change and become the people who God created us to be. The second assumption is that irrespective of identity and orientation, we all have an innate need for sanctuary but that sanctuary is more than just being safe. Whilst being safe is critical, it cannot only be a judgment made by others about the places or situations I find myself in. So for example, I can say that in Quest, we provide safe spaces, or that this conference today is a safe space. And whilst that may be true for me from my perspective, unless you feel that, then it does not matter what I think. So as well as situations and spaces being made safe, we need to also feel safe within them. For me, if I have both, then I have a protection around me which allows me to explore, to experience and to offer connectedness. Connectedness to myself, connectedness to others, and connectedness to the God who nestles in my heart, in my mind, in my intuitions and in my body. Without that feeling of safety, then my brain becomes alert to potential danger. My guess is that as LGBTQQIA plus people of faith, most of us know what it is not to feel safe, to be on alert, to be looking over our shoulders, to fear opening the door to our closet, to worry about opening the door to a building someone else controls. Before I continue, I want to be clear that believing that God nestles in my heart, in my mind, in my intuitions and in my body is a real challenge some days, many days. I'm often left thinking, why would God take up residence here, in this? In for what too long a time I was told was a broken straight body that was in need of repair and which was not good enough and which was sinful. Yet on my good days, when the voices of other people's baggage resident in my thoughts are silenced, God's presence is strong. I'm going to pause briefly here to add something which I think is important for us to know and to understand. At a very simple level, being on alert, having that stress and background, or not so background, fear that many of us live with and carry, has an impact on how we function. Fear and stress triggers a brain response over which we have little or more likely no control, and which begins to limit or turn off the thinking parts of our brains, moving us into a physical state of res readiness to deal with danger. Sensing danger, the brain flicks a switch, if you like, prioritising physical readiness to escape over our capacity to think. The greater our sense of danger, the harder it is for us to think. I'll revisit this later. 
I want now to briefly explore connectedness and to take us back to what for most of us might have been our first place of sanctuary. At one time, we thought as a society that when babies were born, they were cute little bundles of blank slate, empty hard drives, if you like, which for neuro and sensory typical babies would develop functional vision, hearing and communication skills further down the line based on the input that they received from the adults around them. We now know that from the moment of birth, most babies will respond to simple types of interaction and importantly, will initiate interaction. We are born connected. We're born hardwired seeking to connect. Think about the importance that's now placed on what is often referred to as skin to skin for newborns immediately after they are born. Contact to promote connection or attachment to the adults in their lives. At birth, we become embodied outside the sanctuary of our birth mother's body. And through our connectedness with others, we can explore the fullness of that embodiment. I want to next offer a brief clip from my own queer awareness story. I first knew that I was different when I was four. At least that is when I have my first conscious memory associated to my difference. I escaped my home through an open front door and made my way to a local park where I found myself hiding in some long grass, aware of people nearby that I experienced as threatening. I'll not tell the whole story here, but I recall knowing that somehow I was different and that I had to keep myself safe from people who might do something to me because of that difference. If I went back in time now and offered that four-year-old Jared the words and the knowledge that I have now, he would have the same light bulb moment he did then. But in addition, he'd be able to say, I'm gay. So why this clip from my life? I want to go back to something you may have missed as I described my four-year-old's light bulb moment. It's the reason I mentioned our brain response to potential danger and our innate disposition to connectedness from birth. What I experienced was that I was four, only four, and I knew I had to keep myself safe. I just want you to sit with the weight and implication of that for a moment. I'm four and I have to keep myself safe. Where are the grown-ups in this first realisation of queerness? Where is the sense of presence or connectedness to the people who keep me safe? They weren't present in this story and there was no possibility of going and sharing this thing I could not name and exploring it within the sanctuary of my home. At four, I took over responsibility for keeping myself safe. It was at that point that my home became a sanctuary only for the conforming parts of me which I thought would be safe there, but not the gay bit. Except my sexuality and identity is not just a bit, because it's about my embodiment, it's about who I am, about the non-integration or the disintegration and the disconnectedness of what should have been a deepening sense of my embodied sanctuary. The relationship that I had with myself and the relationships that I had with others. And importantly, from the age of four, I'm ta talking about an enduring alertness, an alertness to danger from which I had to protect myself because of a difference I couldn't then fully comprehend and had no chance to explore. So is it any wonder that, like so many, I lived my childhood and adolescence with hidden depression? Or that today, depression can still be my go-to place when I do not feel safe. A point that I want to make here is that as I was preparing for this talk over the last month or so, I realised that in terms of my sexuality and identity, I was effectively an orphan 
from birth. No parents to keep this aspect of me safe. Let me be clear, my parents were loving and caring. And some years after I came out to them, which didn't happen until I was 35, my mum and I shared my four-year-old's story. And she said that like me, she too knew that I was gay when I was little. But like me, as a young mum in a small Scottish parochial working class town, she didn't know what she knew either. I interpret this now as, like me, she knew she had to put it in her closet and keep it in there. So my queer self being orphaned is not a blame statement, but it is a profoundly impacting fact in my story. Typically, when parents welcome a baby into the world, the baby often has an assumed future. And whatever the quality of the parenting, a sizable portion of the population were looking at gender and identity conforming futures that to some extent pass for what is referred to as normal. Now, I know that that isn't quite true. You only need to look at the wonderfully chaotic normal in most families and in my family to know that normal is a marketing myth that we're all asked to buy into. But being queer really pushes the conformity boundaries. And I thank God for that, despite the challenges. The boundaries need pushing, and perhaps at least some of them need dismantling. As LGBTQQIA plus people, most of us must work out who we are and then declare it to a world in which the norm, or should that be the dominant myth, is that everyone should grow into an assumption of straightness in the gender that someone decided for them at birth, placed forever into neat binary boxes of conformity. So our amazing, brave and inspiring queer journeys, because who would choose to walk this path? are often undertaken without the guidance, support and wisdom of parents and peers who are like us. For many of us, we need and seek surrogate support to guide us on our path. And for some, like myself, we can't do that, perhaps do not know that we need to do that until later in our journeys. As LGBTQQIA plus people of faith, our faith, and our sense of the connectedness to God's whispering deep within us, God calling us by the name that they, them, she, he gave us, can make our coming out and our journey more complex, more challenging, can add to a sense of disembodiment, of non-integration or disintegration, as mentioned earlier. Though the message of the gospel and Christ's example clearly tells us that this should not be the case, Still too often it is. As people, we seek inner and outer sanctuary, and we seek it in relation to various aspects of our lives, including our faith lives. Sometimes sanctuary involves buildings, small c churches. But for us, sanctuary cannot be assumed. Whilst it can be offered, we need to feel safe and to, to fully experience it. When we find it, as is so beautifully in, illustrated by the pre-conference YouTube video, we also experience Big C Church. If you've not watched that video, then make a point of setting aside 20 minutes to catch up. It is joyous and it is hopeful. Matthew 18.20 reports Christ as saying, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am with you. I wonder whether that statement presupposes that while Christ welcomes us just as we are, it is in our in the image of God selves that he would prefer us to be in the room. Sanctuary, spaces which are safe, should not be experienced as a gift offered by some generous building manager. They are what Christ demonstrates and what the gospel demands. On that basis, should not our denominational leaders be supporting us to be fully embodied so that we can be truly gathered? 
I do not believe that they should encourage us to gather as a group of disembodied, non-integrated or disintegrated, disconnected, but normative conforming individuals. As LGBTQQIA plus people and people of faith, we must therefore carve out rather than assume our places in the world, in our families, with our friends, in schools and playgrounds, in social spaces and in our churches. The privilege which comes from such assumptions is not ours. In our gatherings, we are an example of the incredibly expansive and unlimited God the image of whom our amazing diversity embodies and represents. When that is celebrated and understood as holy, then, and perhaps only then, have we the potential to experience true spiritual sanctuary, to be truly Big C Church. For me, that's why I belong to Quest. I need sanctuary, spaces where I am safe, and where I feel safe, where I can feel embodied and connected, where my sense of alertness can get a break, where I can be Big C Church with and for others. It's also why Quest and other organisations such as ours are actively involved in partnerships like this. We recognise that we need to ensure that such sanctuaries exist for people like me, and for you and our, and our LGBTQQIA plus siblings, whether that's within our denominational, denominational buildings or outside them. Thank you for listening.